Today we're discussing, and this week we're discussing chapter 2 of Mix It Up, which um, David Grazi entitled, We Are the Champions, a functionalist approach to popular culture. And I can hear Queen singing, We Are the Champions, in my head as this goes. Um, what this chapter is about is the functionalist approach to popular culture. The basic idea here is that popular culture serves a function for society. Um, two main ideas that Grazian goes over of the type of function that it serves. The first is that it helps create solidarity, which means that it connects in individuals to a society or a community. And that second, it allows people to discuss otherwise sensitive issues. Um, so you could think about this as a space to discuss without offending others. And you'll hear me talk about this again and again, right? If you know, uh, you know, you're in a working environment and you talk about somebody on a TV show having an affair, you can pass judgment on that person as much as you want to, right? But if you start to talk about the tawdry affair that's happening with your colleague in your work environment, that's totally inappropriate. You don't want to do that, right? So in a way, it allows you to talk about these issues without actually saying, oh, you know, Billy Bob over in accounting, did you hear about his affair? Woo! Like, that's a problem. Whereas if you talk about, I don't know, what's a famous affair that happened in a television show? Anything from the Kardashians. Uh, you said the Kardashians? Yes. So affairs within the Kardashian clan, you know, it's weird to call perfect. Them they're, they're a group of people, a community. Um, so, not the clan, but a clan. Um, so, Grazian says that, quote, our obsession with professional and intercollegiate athletics, celebrity magazines, and other forms of mass entertainment can be explained in terms of their social uses, or literally their function, in generating solidarity among the individual members of a larger society or community. So hence here we have um, this image of some football game where they we will something forever, right? People with their college sports really recognize I am a Hokey. I went to Virginia Tech. Um, and Nikki Giovanni, Nikki, I'm sorry, Nikki Giovanni famously um, wrote a poem following the mass shooting at Virginia Tech. And it was, we are Virginia Tech. We are the Hokies, right? That kind of identity that people encumber, um, that's what uh, sporting events help us allow us to do. We have, you know, trashy tabloid magazines like Us Weekly that, you know, gets into the Brad and Angelina's secret what really happened on the plane when they got into a fight. And this is Us Weekly, and what's funny, maybe it's not funny, maybe it shows how slow I am. I always thought this was U.S. Weekly, but in a weird way that we'll come to uh, later on, to think about Us Weekly as U.S. Weekly is to think about how pop, how central popular culture is in American culture to how we think about what it means to be American, right? Popular culture. And then you have things like the... Um, uh, 
ball dropping in Times Square for New Year's Eve. The idea of the functionalist approach comes from French sociologist Emile Durkheim. It was around 1858 to 1917. He's considered one of the founders of sociology. Um, one of his works that uh, David Grazian focuses on here is called The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. Um, some of his other major works, he wrote a book called The Division of Labor. He wrote another book called Suicide. These books all look at the function of society. What is society? How can we study it? How can we get to know this thing that's outside of the individual? Uh, so he lays out these four important terms here, um, which we'll come to each in turn. Um, but basically what, what he did was in the elementary forms of religious life, Grazian says he, quote, explored the social role that religion plays in the functioning of human societies. He looked at societies where religion was a central organizing institution of their existence, and the heavy reliance on signs, images, and symbols derived from the natural world and these religions. And for Durkheim, Religion or God did not create man, but man created religion. And Durkheim explains the way that religion functions first and foremost as bringing together the collective. So people begin to see themselves as a collective through their religion. And the religion helps define what morality the society holds as a collective. And in those early days of uh, kind of tribal religions that he's talking about, um, he, he talks very highbrow, lowbrow, the way these, uh, there's different orders of society and those societies are on like a timeline, more advanced, less advanced. I'm not a fan of the way that distinction is made. But when he talks about tribal religions, it's all about segregating and demarcating the self and the other. And if you don't get along with the rules, you become the other. And those rules were quite arbitrary. You can't look at this object except certain people at certain times of the year. And if you violate those rules, you're excommunicated from the community. You don't stand within that collective. <clears throat> so along the way, we get these different ideas, collective conscience, collective effervescence, the sacred profane distinction, which I was just starting to touch upon, and the idea that religion binds people together. Um, so to break into each one, the collective conscience is the set of beliefs or ideas and morals that bring a group of people together. Okay, That is what collective conscience is. Religion itself is a collective conscience. And people create religion to structure their society instead of some god bringing people together with these ideas. Collective effervescence is an important feeling that people get when they participate in um, religious functions. So Grazian says on page 26, it's, quote, a shared feeling of identity in which the individual members of the group, whether a tribe or congregation, experience waves of emotion, a sense of unity, and togetherness. And this is what happens when you generate, you, you, uh, it gets generated among large groups of people, collective effervescence. You also get the sacred profane distinction. Sacred profane is the religious or the secular. And this distinction 
he says, helps distinguish self from other because the outgroup out group would not know the distinction between, between sacred and profane. If everybody in here held this cup to be sacred, and I'm the only person that is allowed to touch the sacred cup, and we're the only ones that know that, somebody comes from the next classroom over and they touch the cup, what do we think of them? They're awful, right? And we're going to banish them from our community because this, they touched the sacred cup. Did anything happen to them? Well, they were banished. They're banished. We're not going to wait around to see if like, God strikes them with lightning or something, right? We're going to tell them to get on out, and we don't care what happens to them at that point. They violated the sacred profane distinction that we hold as a community. And again, it binds us together. That's pretty self-evident. Um, Grazian explains that the rituals of so solidarity um, help to create social cohesion. Social solidarity comes out of the symbols, rituals, and practices that bring people together. He says on page 27 that, quote, a functionalist approach to popular culture emphasizes how the symbols, rituals, and practices surrounding its production and consumption can bring people together by generating a shared sense of social solidarity. And this comes out in any number of ways. And the thing that he focuses on here in the chapter are professional sports teams. He says that they're totemic. And that it means that we attach all types of symbols to sports teams. They then come to represent the cities and regions there. And they often use animals to represent the teams, right? So here I have a picture, picture of the Baltimore Ravens. Why is it the Baltimore Ravens? Anybody know why Baltimore chose the Ravens? We have Ravens here. Y'all don't know who is from or was from Baltimore? Famous poem, The Raven. Oh, Edgar Allan Poe. Oh. Edgar Allan Poe is from Baltimore. If you go to Baltimore, there's actually an Edgar Allan Poe museum. I think maybe in his old house. Don't quote me on that. Um, but that's, right, it becomes a symbol of something. Here, even though they're not animals, cowboys, right? The Dallas Cowboys. And people go nuts with getting team regalia. So the team regalia ends up being a ritual of boundary maintenance. The ritual of boundary maintenance, boundary maintenance of us versus them. We know who the us is because they're wearing our team's colors and uh, paraphernalia that you buy at stores, right? Merch. So you see somebody like this dude with his big helmet on and his jersey, we know he's a Cowboys fan. Oh, what was it? Who did they play two weeks ago? Was it the Ravens? Who are my Cowboys? It just happened to be the Ravens, too. I went to Yogurt. I'm not a Cowboys fan. My family is from Philadelphia. I grew up an Eagles fan. I am a very proud Eagles fan. Um, I was going to Yumalicious on North Collins on the Ravens day, right? And you see, was it was it the Ravens that really crushed the Cowboys? Uh, it was the Saints. It was the week before. I, I saw the Ravens fans too, but I'll use the Saints 
as the example. The game had just let out. I, I didn't think about that when I went to go get yogurt. And I, so I'm driving. There was lots of traffic because there's people crossing the roads and stuff. And I'm seeing the ebullient Saints fans walking. There's a bunch of people. Do you all know where Young Malicious is? you got to cross right over the interstate. It's over by the biscuit bar. Arlington Social House. There's a Salada over there. Uh, there's a uh, Tacos. Um, Torchies is right there. Anyway, it's right across. So a lot of people park over there, actually, because parking's free. So I'm seeing the Saints fans. They're all happy, and they're decked out in their Saints gear. And the Cowboys fans are all walking like, because it was a blowout. Um, so it helps construct the us versus them. There's also ceremonies at all games, matches, and tournaments. Okay, so it happens at a specific. With the ceremonies have to do with not just things that happen at the game, but the time that they happen. Right. So sports games happen at a designated time, even though that for football. This used to be really clear. Saturdays was college football, Sundays was NFL football, and Monday nights there was one game for NFL. Now they're all the time. It gets a little confusing. Um, and Fridays, of course, being high school football. But then with basketball, college, fo college basketball, there's March Madness, right? The NCAA tournament. You've got Super Bowl Sunday. These are designated times when these things happen. They happen in designated spaces, whether it's stadiums, ballparks, arenas, right? We've got this big stadium right here. There are specific gestures that happen when at the games, like stadium waves when people get bored. Or when people, when it's not a boring game and people try to get the wave going and it's like, y'all, I'm trying to watch the game, not go like this. The game's intense. Um, there are specific incantations that happen at sporting events, whether they're cheers or fight songs or national anthems. Um, and it ends up creating a collective effervescence. That idea that there's a feeling in the air that you feel part of something, right? How many of you have gone to a sporting event that you didn't really care about the game, but then when people started cheering, you got caught up in it? Like, yeah! Oh, wait, I wasn't even that excited to begin with. Some of you are willing to admit that. I mean, this happened to me, right? People were like, I told you I'm an Eagles fan. Let's go to this game between the Cowboys and the Saints. I don't really care, right? But then all of a sudden I'm like, yeah! Because you feel it. Um, the same with, I think I may have talked about before, laughing. When you hear laughing, it's contagious, right? Um, whereas if you're sitting watching something by yourself, you don't feel that. And so that makes you happier, trips off the dopamine, and then you like it that much better. Um, so all of this ends up creating social solidarity. Sports in major cities bring people together along otherwise divided communities, along race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, political affiliation, right? So in large cities, where people feel really disconnected from each other, there's not a strong communal connection in somewhere like Dallas, right? Um, or Arlington. It makes people feel part of something and not lonely like normal. It also imbues a sense of national culture. So athletics brings opposing teams together under a national banner. They sing the national anthem. And that's not just in the United States. At many countries, when they have their 
sports teams playing each other, they come together under national pride to unite. So the national identity becomes the shared religious identity, the shared civic religion. And so that's something that's always kind of blown my mind, right? Like you go to a game, I told you I'm a Hokie, I'd go to Hokies football games, and there's a large uh, core of cadets at Virginia Tech, and I mean, I get part of that. They have the core playing, they have the core marching band, in addition to the marching Virginians, which is the Virginia Tech marching band. Um, but then, you know, they have like fighter jets do a flyby, and then you know, the national anthem goes on. Everybody's got to be quiet and watch the national anthem. Why do they do that? The answer is to bring everybody together. Because we don't come, every event that you participate in your life, do people sing the national anthem? When I start class, do I have somebody up here say, oh, say, can you sing? Right? I know you love my singing. Um, we don't do that. So to me, I've always been like, why do we have to sit through this? I want the game to start. I don't need the national anthem. Well, the answer is it brings everybody together collectively. We see each other as a nation and not two cities ready to send two teams of big dudes at each other on a football field. Bash each other. We also get this at rock concerts. And he says that they, quote, bring people together in shared moments of collective solidarity. And this is probably one of my best examples of the way collective effervescence works. You feel the energy when you go to a concert. The music encompasses you. You feel it, right? And it ends up sounding different than what you're actually hearing. How many of you have ever been to a loud concert? You know, I'm not saying like somebody playing an acoustic guitar in here or something. But you go to a bar, they got the lights, loud sound, and you're just in it and you're like, woohoo, right? Then you hear the recording of that concert, and you go, oh, that wasn't that good. How many of you have ever had that feeling? All the time, right? That's collective effervescence. You feel like you're a part of something. Even though the singer might be out of tune, singing off key, the guitarist might be out of tune, there might be sound issues where there's an echo, you know? There might be some feedback going on, and you're just like, you hear the recording and you go, man, why did I think that was so great? It's because of everybody around you and you're feeling something. And notice he's getting this idea of collective effervescence um, from Durkheim's take on religion, right? Religions have that. When people go to church or their religious building, they often get caught up in the emotions of it and feel something. Feel the Holy Ghost or whatever they want to call their individual religions, right? That's collective effervescence. And it's what allows people to go crowd surfing. Has anybody gone crowd surfing in here? Yes? Was it fun? Yeah. Everything you, you hoped for they didn't drop you? No, they didn't drop me. No, I'm ready to be in there. Awesome. Uh, My luck, if I jumped off the stage, people would go, smack. <laughs> and the other end of that, uh, what's his name from Houston? Why am I blanking on his name? Oh, 
there was a stampede basically. Okay. Travis Scott, right? Travis Scott would be like that collective effervescence to the other end, right? People get the crowd at Travis Scott concerts like gets into it. And um, that is like the quintessential collective effervescence, Travis Scott. Right, so you can see all these people captivated by this concert here. I have no idea what that concert is, but it looks awesome. You might even hate the music and be like, man, that was like the best concert I've ever seen. The next idea that he brings up here is the imagined community. Um, an imagined community is a concept by a historian by the name of Benedict Anderson. Uh, Benedict Anderson is has this idea that, or at least Grazian borrows from him, and says that mediated entertainment can bring people together over space and time. Anderson, however, let me see if I got a pen that works. Bye, frown and smile. So you've got a magic community up there. He goes with this term. Print capitalism. And in this before I get into what print capitalism is, it's all about the creation the creation of national identity. Basically, Anderson says we never really had any idea of national identity until we get the rise of the printing press. When the printing press was created, it allows news stories that could be present presented to people over large areas. And what happens in turn um, so the printing press was something invented by Gutenberg. When we get the printing press, we start getting things printed in printing press leads to things printed in national languages. So if you get in your Wayback Machine in Europe, the primary language everything was written in before the printing press was Latin. And it was primarily the Bible. So you had monks sitting in um, Catholics, mo Catholic monasteries, handwriting the Bible over and over again in Latin. Then you get the printing press. You get um, the Protestant Reformation. People starting to do things in their native tongue in Europe. And this is a world-changing moment. And following this, you get the rise of monarchies. Governments that control larger areas of territory because of the printing press. Mind you, most people are illiterate in Europe at that time. But it functioned as a source of power. And so if you think about it, if you take a pretty small country like England, right? It, the British Isles look something, you know, kind of That's my, uh, that's Britain right there. You got Ireland over here. Um, but if you think about the distances here, 
You got whales. What language do they speak in, in Wales? Welsh. Welsh. Right? Then you get the line here where Scotland is. And Scottish before the domination by the um, English had their own language. But if you dial down smaller and smaller areas, right, there's a lot of little serfdoms all over London. Or not London, England. So London's like over here. I know I might have drawn it all. Um, people who live in small areas in medieval England would have separate dialects, right? And over a very short distance. Because somebody that lives here probably rarely talks to anybody over here and almost never talks to anybody over here. There's one group of people, though, that move around a lot. And that's the nobility, right? So if you are nobility, you travel all around here. I know my drawing's beautiful. But you're traveling all around, and then we get the idea what is proper English called in England? What do we call it? English. English. The King's English, right? The king's English, the nobility's English, they're all traveling around and they speak a similar dialect. And that becomes the proper one, right? And so with the invention of the printing press, what do they print things in? The king's English, right? That becomes proper. So then everybody looks to the nobility as if they're doing things correctly when really they're just using their power to make what they do the proper things um, so what ends up happening is that newspapers tell people what is important and now news media more generally right so if you are somebody over here and you're reading what's happening over here in London then you find out oh this is the thing that's important this is the thing that I'm supposed to care about and over time that just gives more power towards those in power and that's why in this sense the royal family is followed by so many people right the royal family in great in the united kingdom shows power that's why people follow the tabloids of what's going on with the royal family but in the united states we don't have royalty right instead of all this where our imagined community emerges from popular culture popular culture is what creates the imagined community in 21st century America he also talks about this idea of pseudo events and a pseudo event is a made for TV event that is specifically for at home consumption. And he goes through a lot of these different ones award shows, presidential nominating conventions, um, things that 
are better watched on television. Like, honestly, I went, when the Red Hot Chili Peppers came here a year ago, I got to see the Red Hot Chili Peppers for the first time. I don't know, they're, they're in my top five. I don't know why it took me so long to go see them. But ticket, it was at Globe Life Field, right? Tickets were expensive. I had crappy seats. It would have been better for me to just watch it at home on a television. I would have had a better experience actually seeing them, right? Because I couldn't see anything, and they had some crazy cameras doing like weird things with lighting on the actual projections of the band. I mean, I loved it. It was a great concert. Don't get me wrong. But as far as actually seeing it, I would have seen it better at home. And there's many things in this way that become pseudo events. So here, uh, this was the Beijing Olympics, I think it was 2008. And China is what, or let me rephrase that. Fireworks were created, invented in China. So a big part of the Beijing Olympics, which I'm sure most of you do not worry, remember because that was 16 years ago, was featuring um, fireworks. One of the ways uh, that, before I get to what, it, what this image is, right, that's part of creating the imagined community are events like Olympics. They just had the French, or the Paris Olympics, right? In the Paris Olympics, what they try to do is the host country tries to sell what it is. Who are the French, right? And so they have the opening ceremony and everything's about selling this narrative about the French. Well, the Chinese did that when the Olympics were in Beijing. Um, and one of the, the ideas you really get, I think, out of the Beijing it was a phenomenal opening ceremony. Y'all should see the 2008 Beijing ceremonies. You get a very firm sense of collective identity in um, Chinese culture, which is a very important thing, as opposed to an American culture where we focus on the individual, right? Um, so a lot of the different uh, theatrics were all based on the collective. But in order to tell the story of China, they also emphasized um, fireworks. And so they had, at one point, these footprints of fireworks going throughout the city. And when you were watching it at home on your television, you saw firework footprints going through Beijing. However, there were no firework footprints that went through Beijing. They were all computer generated for the audiences at home. So if you were standing outside in Beijing during the opening ceremonies for the Olympics, you would not have seen this. That is not something that ever happened. It was a pseudo event, a made for TV event. And one of the examples that Grazian talks about was um, when Barack Obama won the presidency, he gave a speech at Hyde Park in Chicago, which is a huge park, and it was L-shaped. I mean, it was really odd. So it was like this, right? Obama was over here speaking. That's my stick figure of Obama giving a speech. Now, how on earth? And there's like trees over here. If you're over here, how do you get to see the speech? You just have to be right there. 
you, I mean, maybe if you're over here, but over here, you can't see it at all. They had screens. So you're mediated in the event that's there. You're probably struggling to see it, but they also aired it on television. So your experience of seeing Obama in Hyde Park would be way better if you just sat on your ass at home, right? Than actually going there. But if you go there, what do you get to feel? Y'all are getting there. What's the term from class today? Collective effervescence. Collective effervescence, right? You get that feeling of, oh man, I was there. I was at Hyde Park. I was feeling it. It was electric. I'm high-fiving everybody, talking about how happy I am and everything, right? That's the feeling. The event itself is a pseudo event that's made for TV because if you actually want a good experience hearing the speech, seeing him give the speech, then the best thing to do is to actually be there. I remember um, his inauguration, I was living in Northern Virginia, 2008. I was working on my PhD and I thought about going. And I went down to the metro station to get a ticket. You had to like buy a metro ticket in advance because it was so busy. The, the, that metro station is like in the inner middle of the interstate. You gotta like go, come across a bridge. The line went over the bridge and like snaked around the parking lot to get your metro ticket. And I was like, I think I'm good. I'll go to the bar and watch the speech. I'll watch the inauguration with people hanging out in a bar instead of going down there. And it, it turned out to be like, it was bitterly cold that day. It was like in the 20s. See, you know, picture that. But you, if you actually went, you can say, ah, I was there. I was at the inauguration, right? That's the idea here.